you may have come across the video I made about four years ago on how to make prints of your art through outsourcing and ordering through a few different print companies. Well, about seven months ago, I made the leap to buy my own printer to finally start printing at home. So this round, I will be going into the reasons I chose to do so, how I went about deciding between the printer I decided to go with, and then of course, how to actually make the prints at home. Now, if you already have a professional printer and are just looking for how to actually make the prints, I will put the timestamp for the how-to section in the description below so you can skip over all this pre-information on deciding between different printers and all of that. Also, if you are new to the art print world and you are trying to decide between whether you want to go the route of ordering your prints and outsourcing or making your own prints at home and getting your own printer, I will put the link to my older video on ordering through different print companies below. That way you can see which route might be best for you. As a disclaimer, of course, there are a million different ways to go about making prints of your art. And this is just what has worked for me and my style. Hopefully if this video helps you, it'll just make that learning curve a lot smoother for you. And just so you all know, I am currently in my seventh month of pregnancy right now. So if I seem a little bit out of breath, I apologize in advance. My body is just in overdrive at the moment. But for now, let's go ahead and dive right in. First, on the reasons why I chose to buy my own printer, and I will say there are two reasons for this. The first is I started doing art shows, and it was going to be so much easier for me to be able to print out last minute prints just so I can adjust my stock as needed. And the even bigger reason is as I continue to create more pieces and wanted to offer more reproductions, I dreaded the idea of having to buy bulk prints up front and keep so many more on hand. The thing is, you never know how long it is going to take you to sell these prints. And buying bulk orders up front, they take up space as well as cost a lot of money. Of course, you can order through print companies as you get requests and as the orders come in. But if you are selling through platforms like Etsy, turnaround time is huge. So ordering prints as all the print orders came through was not a route that I chose to go. But some artists may do this if they live in an area where they print at a local print shop and they can just drive to pick it up. For me, I didn't want to rely on somebody else or be crunched on time for reproductions that I could offer. I will say that I still absolutely love the company that I've used all these years. I print from home and I will continue to use them maybe for really large prints or just bulk orders that I just don't want to do myself. I'd rather have them do. But here we are and I am excited to share with you all what I have learned about making my own prints at home. First, I will say that for art prints, you'll want to be researching inkjet printers, not laser printers. Inkjet printers work with dye or pigment-based inks and are great for high-quality image printing, whereas laser printers are great for high text-based printing, and those are usually your standard home printers. As I started researching, I found that there seemed to be two more well-known brands that most artists were using, and those were Epson and Canon. Ultimately, both have fantastic options, and it is overwhelming with the amount of choices that you have. I started with YouTube, Google searches, and reaching out to those other artists to figure out what they were using, and I would say that a fair amount used both of them, but maybe more so Canon than Epson. But I ultimately narrowed it down to Canon that I wanted to go with. That is for one main reason, and that is because they have some off-brand inks that are compatible with Canon printers, versus Epson that emphasizes that only Epson ink cartridges are compatible with their printers. Now, before you go and criticize the idea of using off-brand inks, let me just say that I would not resort to that as a first choice. However, if there were ever supply chain issues with Canon, that would simply give me peace of mind that there were other options that I could go with if needed. So once I decided on going with Canon, I needed to make a decision on whether I wanted a printer with dye-based inks or pigment-based inks. I would suggest doing a quick separate search on their differences, but a simple definition that I found online is that dye-based inks are inks that use color substances that are fully dissolved in a liquid, whereas pigment inks consist of a fine powder of solid colorants. You can see the analogy there on the right. That is a salt versus sand analogy, and this comes from printerbase.co.uk. So it says that if you put salt into water and mix it, it will dissolve and form part of the liquid, just like a dye ink will. But if you put sand into water and mix it, the sand won't dissolve and will eventually settle like a pigment ink. 
Although both are similar in terms of output, dye-based inks are more well known to offer more vibrancy, but pigment inks are more so archival and built to last, and producing high-quality archival prints was a deciding factor for me in choosing to go with pigment-based inks, and also because pigment inks also offer a variety of black ink options, which is great for the style of work that I do. Before diving into the two pigment printers I decided between, I did want to share the two dye base printers I was looking into, and those were the Canon Pigma Pro 100 and the Canon Pigma Pro 200, and I will also link these below. The Canon Pigma Pro 200 is the newer version, although at the time of this video, it seems that the 100 is still very popular. In addition to being a higher cost than the 200, it looks like it is out of stock here for the 200, but I do remember looking at this a while ago and the 200 was cheaper. If I had gone with the dye-based inks, I was going to choose the 200, and one of the deciding factors was because it has an LCD screen, which I just prefer to have on my printers. When it comes to the pigment-based printers, there were two I was deciding between, the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 300 and the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 1000. The pros to the 1000 are that it can print up to 17 by 22 inches, which is pretty large, and it also has larger ink cartridges, which means higher page yield, so you will need to replace the cartridges less frequently. The ink actually costs less per milliliter as well than the 300 inks, although this may be hard to swallow given that the cost of a single ink cartridge is about $60 versus $13 for the 300 ink cartridges, and it would take you about $700 for a full ink replacement for the 1000. Now, I decided on the 300 over the 1000 for two main reasons. The first is the physical size. I don't have a huge space and the 1000 is larger. And with the 300, I could still print up to 13 by 19, which is perfect for the print sizes that I offer. The second reason is, is I wasn't sure how frequently I would be printing and I didn't want to risk the larger ink cartridges possibly drying up. And I also knew that I could always sell it later on and upgrade to the 1000 if needed. And I will say that I've been using my ProGraph Pro 300 printer for seven months now, and I absolutely love it, and I have no regrets in my decision. I will say that whichever printer and inks you are deciding between, page yield is a huge factor you'll want to take into consideration. This is something that is not always marketed upfront with printers, but you'll be able to find the specs on the company website. I have linked Canon's page yield page here below. Basically, page yield is the number of pages that are estimated to be printed that you will get for a single ink cartridge before it needs to be replaced. So if I click on the Image ProGraph Pro 300 here on Canon's website, let me zoom in, it's going to give me examples of print sizes and then how many pages are estimated to be printed for those print sizes for each of these 10 ink cartridges here. And then on the far right, we can see sample image sizes as well. Of course, we know that the 1000 has much larger ink cartridges, but I did take the time to look at the page yields for the 300 to make sure that I'd be okay with the potential frequency I would need to replace the inks. And ultimately, the page yield of the 1000 was better, but the other two reasons I wanted to go with the 300 outweighed the page yield comparison, and it is still a page yield that I am perfectly fine with. If you are getting a ton of print requests, on the other hand, and are just going to town with demand, then the 1000 might be a better option for you. So with my final decision on the Canon Image ProGraph Pro 300 printer, I get the Canon Lucia Pro PFI 300 inks here, which you can buy on Amazon and I will link it all below. You can also buy directly through the Canon website. If they are out of stock for this group package, you can also buy them individually. And as you can see, there are a total of 10 ink tanks. And one note I wanted to mention real quick on the topic of inks is to take a look at your local recycling options for your old ink cartridges as you go through them. Most staples or office depots will take old cartridges and they may offer a rewards program. And as artists, we are just obviously consuming products that can have a high environmental impact and recycling your ink cartridges is such an easy way to help reduce our waste. In terms of paper, I ordered several sample kits off Amazon here to try, which I will link below. Hannah Mula, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, is a top quality brand. There is also Moab and a few others, but I decided to stick with the same paper I have actually ordered my prints with for all these years through iPrint from Home, which is the LexJet archival matte paper. And this is for my scratchboard prints. I ordered this directly through LexJet. And then I use the Canon Lester photographic paper for my watercolor prints. 
different. So you can order this Pro Paper Sampler Kit from Canon as well, but this is more so for photographic prints. And the paper sample kits will all offer various finishes and surfaces, ones that are textured, ones that are smooth, matte versus glossy. So this is a great way to see what your preference will be and what looks best for your art. Just make sure that if you are wanting to offer archival prints, that the paper is archival and acid free. And that should be a top requirement in your decision on your paper. Now it is time to dive into the how-to section of how to actually go about printing your art at home. The first step to making prints is you will need to get a final image of your artwork in a digital file, and there are several ways of going about this. The first is you can take a picture of your artwork, and I would recommend taking it outside in natural daylight, avoiding direct sunlight, unless you have a photography studio lighting set up indoors. I recommend a DSLR camera for best quality, but you can absolutely use a smartphone or other basic camera that you already have. The second option is you can scan your artwork. You will need a high quality scanner or you can try taking it to a local FedEx or Kinko's. And keep in mind that you can use the Photo Merge tool in Photoshop for larger pieces that doesn't fit as a whole on a scanner if you don't have a large enough one. The third option is you can also see if there is a local print shop that has a setup to take pictures of your artwork. However, they may want you to order prints through them or charge a fee. The most important note though, is when you get the digital file of your artwork is it needs to be at least 300 DPI for printing. So I use a combination of taking pictures of my art as well as scanning. For scanning, I have this Epson Perfection V39 scanner here, which I will link below. I scan my smaller pieces when I do five by sevens or eight by tens. You can scan larger pieces in sections and use the photo merge element in Photoshop, however, the sides of my scanner do not allow larger boards to sit completely flat, so those for me tend to come out blurry. Um, I haven't found a way around it just yet, but otherwise for the smaller pieces, this scanner is amazing and saves me a lot of time. It does connect right to my computer, and once you download the software, you'll have the preview and scanning options available to select. And for larger pieces, I have this easel here, which when it is set up, it is nice and tall to prop up my artwork. And then I have my DSLR camera. This is the Nikon D3300 camera, and it works great. But of course, you can use a smartphone or any other basic camera that you currently have. I also have these two studio lights that I use when I am shooting to get the final image of the artwork indoors. And these are great because they have so many different settings. You can adjust the warmth or the coolness as well as making it brighter or of course dimmer to get that perfect lighting for the final image. And I will place links for all these in the description below. Here in Photoshop, I have a five by seven piece that I scanned in. Usually I touch up any blemishes that might've been on the scanner or image, and you may have to adjust the settings to get as close to the original as possible. Once you have the final image, you are going to need to think about the size of print you want to offer, as well as what internal or external borders you are going to want to print with. For some terminology, internal borders will be included in the full size of the image, meaning that they are inside the printing area, whereas external borders will be on the outside of the print area and will be in addition to the size of the print you are printing. Typically with fine art prints, you will keep the artwork set to size and add external borders. This will make it easy for you and your buyers to handle the print, get it matted, and framed. For my prints, I always have the artwork set to size and I will add a nice professional external white border space around the print. Usually this will be anywhere from a half an inch to two inches depending on the size of the art and the overall full size of the paper. So here you can see some of the sizes that I offer. This is a five by seven print and I offer these on eight by 10 size paper. I offer my eight by 10 prints on nine by 12 paper and my 11 by 14 prints on 12 by 16 paper. To go back to the image that we're editing, we are going to need to add borders to the image, um, but first I'm going to make sure that the image is actually set to size. So I'm going to go to the image tab and image size and just make sure that it is set to the appropriate size that I'm printing, which is five by seven. And the resolution needs to be at least 300 DPI. This is the standard for printing. It can be more than this, but it has to be at least 300. 
okay? Now there are two ways to go about adding the borders. If you have it set to a background currently, we can leave it like this. And in this case, we just wanna to check to make sure that our background color is set to white, which is the hexadecimal for the pure white is FFF, FFF. So we'll go ahead and hit okay. Then we can just go to the image tab again and then canvas size. And we'll change this from pixels to inches to make the conversion easier. Because this is landscape, my width is going to be 10 and my height is going to be eight since that's the paper size that I'm printing. And I will hit okay. And that gives us an image ready to go and ready to print. Now, if I already had this set to a layer, I'm just gonna back up here. If I had this image set to a layer, instead of a background. We can also do this by first, of course, checking to make sure the image size is correct, which we already did. Then we can go ahead and adjust the canvas size, just like we did as well. Change this to inches. We're gonna go to 10 by eight. Okay, but this is still, this is now a transparent background instead of a fill background. So under here, I'm just going to go to layer, new fill layer and solid color and just hit OK. That is going to add, and you can check the color here, it should be the pure white, the FFF, and hit OK. Now we just want to send that layer to the back. You can simply just go to Layer, Arrange, and Send to Back. And this will be the same, and now we have an image to print as well. We are ready to go. When it comes to prepping the paper media you chose to go with, you will need to decide if you want to cut the paper to size before you print or if you want to trim after. And also if you want to print multiples onto one page, you'll have to keep in mind that you will tr be trimming that after as well. For me with my scratchboard prints, because I use a matte paper finish and the primary color of my prints are black, matte scratches very easily, so I need to cut the paper to size before I print. With my watercolor work that's on a luster photographic paper and it's also very bright and vibrant, I still do prefer to cut the paper to size before I print and print single prints out. That way I don't have to worry about putting any of the prints through the paper cutter after the fact. But I will be adding a link below to a video that walks you through how to print multiple images onto one page in Photoshop. For a paper cutter, I have this Dolly 552 Professional Rotary Trimmer and I absolutely love it and I highly recommend. It cuts up to 20 inches in length and it is self-sharpening as it goes. This is perfect for my 13 by 19 sheets that I cut down before I print. So here's one of the 13 by 19 sheets that I get. And you can just use the guidelines on the cutter, but I have found it easiest to actually use a yardstick or a ruler to outline the cut first. So with the sizes that I print, with the 5x7 pieces of artwork that I print onto 8x10 paper, of course the full size of the paper would be 8x10. And then for my 8x10 artworks prints, I put them on a 9x12 paper. That's what it would look like here. And then for my 11 by 14 prints, I do cut the paper to 12 by 16. So this is what the, those borders will look like. And this little piece here just comes right off. So you don't, in case you have larger pieces. And I also have this small Fiskars paper cutter, which is easy to get out when I just need to trim some photographic paper as well. So I highly recommend having both of these on hand. They will save you a lot of time. If you're going to use a paper that differs from the printer brand that you chose, you will need to set up the printer to recognize that media type so it prints properly. I'm going to link this video here on how to use the Canon Media Configuration Tool that will walk you through it step by step. And when you get to the section on ICC Profiles, you will want to go to the company website for whichever brand of paper that you are using to download the appropriate file. Here's an example if you are going to use Hannah Mula, you would enter your printer brand and the model. And as far as entering custom paper sizes that are not already on your computer, for Mac, if you go to print settings and you can go in any app into print settings, just go here to print and under print settings, you are going to go to paper size. And then if you scroll down to manage custom sizes, you can use this plus button to enter a custom size in.
Once you have your paper media, custom paper sizes, ICC ink profiles, and final image ready to go, we need to select the appropriate printing options in the app we are printing from. Now, with my printer, I will also need to select the appropriate printing options on the printer itself, which I will do next, but this process will vary from printer to printer because not all printers have screens on them. So first, for selecting the options on the computer, whichever app I am in, whether that be Preview on Mac or Photoshop, I am going to go to Print. And first, we will need to select the appropriate printer, which for me is the Canon Pro 300 series. Then I'm going to make sure I have the correct layout. Because this is a horizontal landscape one, it's already selected. If it was on vertical, you'd want to make sure the vertical portrait one, you want to make sure to change it to landscape or vice versa. Now we will go ahead and under print settings, the first thing I'm going to do is select the appropriate paper size, which for me, since I'm printing on an 8x10, that is already configured on my Mac, but I'm going to make sure that I select the 8x10 borderless because we've already added the full borders and we cut the paper to size so everything is ready to go. So I'm going to have the 8x10 borderless option selected. If I look further down on the page, I can also see the custom sizes that I have in here as well. Next, I will want to go to select quality in media. And here we're going to select the appropriate media type or paper that we configured. For me, it's going to be under custom and I have the Hannah Mula Rag Ultra Smooth that I configured for my computer and my printer. Obviously, you can go through these and you might, you know, if, if you're just doing a Canon paper, you can select one of these. If it's photo papers or the fine art papers, you have all these different options depending on which one you're going with. So for here, we're going to select this profile. And since I'm printing on an 8 by 10 the page source for me will be from the top feed tray, not the manual feed tray. The manual feed tray is in the back of the printer, and that one I only really need to use with my larger pieces, like the 12 by 16s And then the, the print quality, I always leave at the highest setting. Then we will need to go to color matching. Sometimes it will default to the Canon color matching, which you will use if you are using a Canon paper. But because this is a special paper that I configured, I want to make sure to click on color sync and choose the appropriate ICC profile that lines up with the paper that I am using. From here, we are just going to click save. And everything is now ready to go, except for having to go to the printer itself for me and entering all my options there. All right, so here we are at the printer. The first thing I'm going to do is load the paper into the top feed tray here. It's very, very important to make sure that you're putting the print side of the surface facing outwards. That way it's going to print onto the, the appropriate side. Make sure you check the paper that you're printing with. I'm going to close that, it's all set in there. And then, as I mentioned before, with my printer, I will also need to select the appropriate settings on the printer itself. So. Um, coming here, it's just going to ask me, it's going to ask me what type of paper that I put in there, so what, what I loaded in. So with the page, oh, the page side just went away, but that's okay. Um, so I'm first going to go to here where it says letter and pro lesser. That's the last printing print setting that I used. So I'm going to do for the page size, I am going to go down and find 8 by 10 right here. And then for the type, this is going to be whatever, whatever paper that you're using. For me, it is going to be the custom one, the, the Hannah Mula Rag Ultra Smooth. That's what I selected on the computer. And then I'm going to click on register. Just give it one minute. All right, so now we have everything selected appropriately. And you can manage your ink levels here. I have plenty of uh, matte black ink in there, so we are totally fine. And now we are good to finally click print. And the settings will come up one more time here. We have borderless. Just check everything over one final time before I go ahead and click print. All right, we're good to go. So here it's going to start.
Um, I do want to advise that these professional inkjet printers do take a lot more time to print than your everyday home printers. As you can tell, they will make a lot of noise and seem like they are doing their own thing, but just be patient. This will probably take a few minutes. And finally, here is our print. It is recommended to leave it, I believe, for at least 24 hours to dry somewhere before you put it in any packaging. So just be mindful of that. When it comes to offering limited versus open edition prints, you are really just going to have to decide which works best for you. But I will be placing a link to another video in the description below to another artist who compiled a video on this topic that really helped me when I was first starting out. But just so you know, what I do is I offer open edition prints for my Watercolor Wildlife series. That's the first series I started out with as an artist and that worked great for me. But as I made the transition to Scratchboard and really got into my new style, I decided to go the limited edition route. For my standard sizes, I usually offer a couple hundred in this series, but for my larger custom sizes, I'll probably have 10 to 50 prints in this series, but I know that over time that will probably change. When it comes to signing your prints, there are so many variations and preferences. This is just what I do. For my limited edition scratchboard prints, I sign it with the title of the artwork in the bottom left. In the middle, I put the number in the series. So this is five of 240 total that I'm offering. And then I sign my full name on the bottom right. For my open edition watercolor prints, this is a G clay fine art print on like a watercolor type paper. I do sign it on the back in pencil with the year, but I also let the customers know on my Etsy postings that I can sign it on the front if they would prefer, and I can actually use watercolor to sign these ones. For the photographic prints, and this one's in its packaging, but this is on a luster finish. Um, I can, I don't sign these typically, but I do let my customers know in the post that I can sign it on the front if they would like. And the only thing that would really go on a luster or like glossy surface, um, I found that would work is a fine liner permanent marker Sharpie pen. For packaging my prints, these are all the materials that I use. First, you'll want to get some matte backing boards like this, and you will want to make sure that these are acid free. I'll link the ones below that I get. And again, they need to be acid free, just like the paper that you use for your prints needs to be acid free if you are doing archival uh, fine art prints. Very, very important because over time, this can start to yellow if it's not acid free and that could eat away at your print depending on how long it's in there and what kind of conditions it is in. Then I offer these clear bags. Now they offer all different kinds. They offer acid free ones and all of that. They are a lot more expensive though, but there are various different options that you can get. I get mine from clearbags.com. And then I also have this little label that I print these off individually. I just have a label on these for my art shows. Um, and this just says G Clay Fine Art Print, eight by 10 print on nine by 12 paper. And I just note that it's a reproduction of scratchboard art. And then for the marketing material that I include, I always include a business card, of course. And then I have just an artist statement and because I have a unique, or I use a unique medium, I put a little snippet there of what Scratchboard art is and I get these all printed from Vistaprint. And then I also, of course, include a certificate of authenticity. Definitely important to include if you are offering limited edition prints or G Clay Fine Art prints. I just printed the template, I believe, off of Etsy, like it was a digital download. And then I include that with all of my, my prints. And then we have these rigid mailers. I believe I initially ordered these years ago and I'm still, I still have them in stock, but I got these from eBay a long time ago. I'll see if they're still on the website, but I'm sure that you can get these anywhere. I have craft ones as well as these white ones and I just brand them. You know, I always put the do not bend sticker on them if you're mailing them out and I just put a little bit of my branding with stamps on them. And then in the end, this is what a final package print will look like with the back. I almost forgot to mention that something I recently started doing as well is I now include a, an acid-free cardstock 
what I call cover protector on top of my prints, especially for art shows. So because I use a matte finish and the prints that I do are mostly really dark ink or black, they mark and scratch so, so easily. Even if like the slightest little brush goes against it, it can scratch. So this cardstock helps protect that against any types of marks. And then what I'll usually do for art shows is I'll have a, I'll have sample prints out that don't have the cardstock in front so people can look through them. And then when I mail them or I hand the prints when somebody buys them, I will hand it to them with the cardstock on top so it's fully protected for them until they're ready to take it out and frame it. All right, that is all I have for you. I hope that this video has been helpful and it makes that transition to printing at home a lot smoother. Please be sure to check out the notes and the links in the description below. Those should help you even more. But for now, I will wish you all the best of luck in this new chapter in printing your artwork at home.